Good afternoon, and a still good morning to those of you joining from the West. Thank you for joining NACO for today's webinar, Building Resilience and Preserving Missions Through the Department of Defense Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration, the REPI program. My name is Rob Zappel. I'm a commissioner in New Hanover County, North Carolina. It's my honor to also serve as a member of NACO's Resilient Counties Advisory Board and a subcommittee vice chair on NACO's Environment, Energy, and Land Use, also known as the EELU Policy Steering Committee. It's my pleasure to serve as today's webinar moderator. And before we begin the webinar, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NACO website after the webinar finishes. We'll also include the presentation materials. Now, if you have any questions, please open the Q&A icon on your toolbar and enter your questions there. This will allow our guest speakers to track questions and follow up with you. If you need technical assistance, drop a note into the chat box, which is also located on your toolbar. Now, turning to the focus of today's webinar, counties and military installations alike face growing threats from severe flooding, catastrophic wildfires, drought, and other extreme weather events. As you'll hear today, the DOD REPI program has an impactful and unique ability to assist counties in advancing resilience and climate action goals through solutions such as nature-based infrastructure, all while protecting the critical missions and military installations and other benefits, co-benefits, such as agriculture, lands, preservation, and habitat protection. NACO is thankful for our collaborative and ongoing partnership with the DOD REPI program. Many of you may have attended past NACO in-person or virtual events featuring the REPI team in recent years. And we're really excited to work with REPI on this new focus uh, area of resilience. Now, we are grateful to be joined today by Jamie Simon with REPI to lead our discussion. Jamie serves as Director of External Affairs and Communications with REPI within the Office of Assistant Secretary of Defense. Thank you, as always, Jamie, for joining us and interacting with NACO and America's county leaders. And for a deeper dive into what uh, REPI resilience efforts looks like on the ground in communities, we will zoom into efforts in my home region of Eastern North Carolina. We are grateful to be joined by Bill Carey, partner with Brooks Pierce, to lead this overview and snapshot. Bill has been with us, uh, with Brooks Pierce, that is, since 1976, and additionally served one year as the general counsel to the North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, in uh, recent years, Bill has worked with the US Department of Defense and several NGOs to identify ways to strengthen the resilience of coastal DOD facilities, leading to some successful REPI proposals. He's also actively engaged with SERPPAS, SERPAS, the Southeast Regional Partnership for Planning and Sustainability, which brings together state and federal agencies from six southeastern states to focus on environmental sustainability initiatives that promote conservation as part of an assur assuring military readiness. It is now focusing on coastal resilience issues. Among the awards and recognition he has received is the North Carolina Coastal Federation's Pelican Award for leadership and commitment to advancing effective coastal policy in 2019. Thank you, Bill, for joining us today. This is such a critical issue to our region in North Carolina and my home community. Uh, and boy, that's the truth. As we uh, you know, argue and, and work for funds for our um, expanding our beach uh, renourishment programs here in Southeast North Carolina, especially in North Carolina, excuse me, in uh, New Hanover County. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our guests, first starting with Jamie and then to Bill. The floor is yours. Take it away, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner, and hello to everyone. Um, I appreciate you know, the, the kind introduction and obviously the invitation to speak at today's webinar. I'm excited to tell you guys a little bit more today about um, the Department of Defense's Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program, which I'm gonna reference um, as REPI for short, um, and then also some upcoming opportunities that we have. Um, I also want to just take this moment and quickly introduce my coworker, Elizabeth Kendrick, um, who has joined us today and can help answer any and all questions. So if there are any questions that come up, feel free to leave them to the end, or you can put them in the, um, in the chat box as well. 
And so before jumping into different components of the REPI program, I'd like to start by explaining why partnerships, especially with counties, are critical to protecting the Department of Defense's mission and critical operations. So as it may be surprising to hear, um, but the Department of Defense owns and manages 27 million acres of land that contain high quality and often unique habitats that provide food and shelter for more than um, like 550 at-risk species. These natural and undeveloped landscapes, like the one you are seeing here, provide our installation and ranges with access to realistic training environments um, safe open spaces for testing, you know, new vehicles, aircraft, and weapon systems. So as you can see in the slide depicted, um, you know, fairly rural in the beginning, we've got, um, you know, some water, some ponds, some forest, et cetera. So, you know, very ideal for test training and operating. However, as you guys are really um, probably more knowledgeable than I am at times, just the climate has changed a little bit around our DOD bases. Um, you know, population has growth, community development, our insulation start to become less isolated and we can sometimes disturb our neighbors with our noise, dust, smoke, and our training. So therefore um, we need to partner with local stakeholders to promote compatible land use, protect um, important habitats and natural resources and enhance resilience in the face of climate change. And there are you know, a lot of ways that DOD um, works with communities to, to sustain our natural landscapes around our installations. Um, several available tools and programs are listed here. And I'm just gonna probably call out one of them, but um, these are all ones that you might be familiar with. But I would like to just highlight one quickly, which is, um, the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, also known as OLDCC, um, and formerly known as OEA for anyone um, who isn't tracking the name change. So Old CC has two unique programs that this audience I think would be interested in, which one is the Defense Community Infrastructure Program, as well as the Military Installation Sustainability Program. Um, I can't go into all the details, I gave you kind of just, just wanted to flag those, as I said. So under the Military Installation Sustainability Program, um, Old CC provides technical and financial assistance to states and local government to develop compatible use plans and military installation resilience reviews. So these plans um, incentivize and they are designed to help communities and installations address any compatibility or resilience uh, challenges. Both studies only require a 10% cost share and provide land use recommendations that support the military mission and community growth, making them excellent resources for partners interested in developing a resilience project. So I did want to flag that uh, before I go into some more details about REPI. So now that you've heard um, how the Department of Defense works to sustain military mission capabilities, I'd like to share more about the REPI program, which works with military leadership, uh, government officials, land trusts, and counties to address any um, current or impending encroachment threats. So as you can see on the screen, we kind of have it, um, the program is broken into three main components. So the first is stakeholder engagement. Um, as you can saw on the previous slide, REPI works with internal programs that support um, similar missions, but there is also external coordination and collaboration with counties, state agencies, non-governmental organizations, academic institutes, and federal agencies. We have landscape um, partnerships are the next piece. These partnerships allow us to focus our stakeholder engagement in targeted regions or landscapes um, and we can focus on a diverse set of partners. We have two um, regional partnerships that you might have heard of as well, one being the Southeast Regional Partnership for Planning and Sustainability, and the second is the Western Regional Partnership. These groups bring together representatives from the Department of Defense, other federal agencies, and state partners that focus on developing um, 
collaboration, collaborative solutions to share on shared challenges. Another really large endeavor we have is the Sentinel Landscape Partnership. It is um, a large component com of our engagement with regional partners. So it was established in 2013 by the US Department of Agriculture, Department of Defense, and Department of the Interior. And this partnership um, mission is to strengthen military readiness, conserve national resources, bolster agricultural and forest economies, and increase the resilience um, to climate change. And there are currently seven designated sentinel landscapes across the country. One of them is in Eastern North Carolina, um, which we'll be talking about in more detail a little bit later today. And then currently we have 11 new proposed landscapes being reviewed at the federal level and hopefully decisions will be made um, by the end of January. And then last but certainly not least um, is the installation level encroachment management partnerships, which we call our REPI projects. So every year the military services submit REPI projects to our office and then um, we review those. Oh, and then we go out um, with those projects. So as many of you know, REPI has traditionally focused on encroachment that stems from land use conservation around our bases, um, namely incompatible development or habitat loss. However, in really exciting news, two years ago, our program scope was expanded by Congress to allow um, REPI funds projects designed to promote resilience activities that protect, um, restore, and enhance off-base um, natural infrastructure and sustain military mission capabilities from climate change impacts such as flooding, drought, and wildfire. So really, um, I know many of you are very familiar with REPI, especially as I said, under incompatible development and um, species, but now um, in very exciting news, like I said, we can now start doing climate resiliency projects. Um, in addition to that, we also got um, a plus up in our budget. So not only do we have this new authority, but we also have funding um, to support these projects. And as you can see here, REPI supports projects all across the country. We have a wide range of partners um, and organizations we work with. So as you can see, we, we're probably um, working very closely in, within your county. So to date, we have 115 locations in 35 states and territories across the country. And through these projects, the Department of Defense has been able to leverage over a billion dollars in defense funds and we've leveraged um, about 975 million in partner funds. So as I said, this is real money um, that's going directly to your counties out into the state. And so really excited to share these opportunities with you. It's a little technical and I'm gonna try not, not to be too technical today but I did wanna just let you know about our authority. So we have, um, our main authority is 10 USC 2684A, which allows um, the department to enter in these cost sharing agreements with state or local governments or private conservation organizations. As I said, either to limit encroachment, um, preserve habitat or to make, maintain and improve military installation resilience. And then um, also something that's really exciting to share is we also have a DOD authority, which we call the DOD um, funds as match. And so what this states is that our DOD money can be used to match against other federal programs. Um, and I just want to emphasize that one more time. So again, our RECI DOD dollars can be used as a match. So if you're Thinking of resilient projects, I think a good example is um, for anyone planning a main application for the FEMA BRIC program, um, REPI funds can be used to satisfy the BRIC program 25% non-federal cost sharing requirement. So again, a really exciting um, change and also one that allows a lot more flexibility. 
And then the last authority I will mention today is the um, 10 USC 2679, um, which is also known as the Intergovernmental Support Agreement. So under this authority, the military departments can enter into agreements with states and local governments to provide, um, receive, and share installation support activities, including actions that build resilience to climate change. So I did just want to touch on those three authorities um, fairly quickly. And so as I stated for fiscal year um, 22, the RESI program budget has been doubled to $150 million. So that's incredible news for us. And again, the focus of that additional increase of the budget was to include money um, to work on resilience projects. So a lot of the budget, um, portion of the budget goes towards our annual RESI challenge process, which kicked off in September just in September of this year. Refuge Challenge is a um, competition uh, funding allocated for refuge projects that result through large scale innovation. The goal is to encourage recipients to look beyond traditional conservation tools and consider creative approaches that develop new partner engagement and attract new sources of funding, including market-based strategies and private invest investment. Um, so this year we put on the table a total of 40 million available for Repi Challenge and up to 25 million um, can be allocated towards climate resilient projects. So this may include, um, you know, executing prescribed burns, removing hazardous fuels to reduce, reduce the risk of wildfire, um, you know, installing storm water, um, drainage basins to protect groundwater resources, constructing living shorelines to reduce erosion and recharging aquifers to enhance drought resilience. So for Repi Challenge, this is a 50% cost share requirement um, for Repi Challenge, but our definition of in-kind services is very broad and includes any cost towards the project that would otherwise be um, deferred. So with that, I just want to um, close out my presentation by re-emphasizing some of the available opportunities, sharing how we can get um, involved in the programs that we saw today. So I know I touched on these points, you know, fairly quickly, but again, I really wanted to emphasize the DOD Funds as Match Authority, which presents an excellent opportunity for counties and other partners to leverage refuge funding to satisfy the cost sharing requirement of any um, conservation or resilience program of any federal agency. And so I think that's just such a huge opportunity that I want to make sure you guys are aware of um, and utilizing. And I also encourage you to explore our um, 2022 refuge challenge request for proposals. While I realize the deadline is Proposal is for Monday, um, November 22nd. Um, several projects are multi-year efforts that require continued support from local partners. Um, and so with that, I just want to turn it back over to you, Commissioner. And I thank you again very much for this opportunity to speak today. And I'm um, happy to answer questions at the end. Jamie, one quick thing before we, we lose you here, or you know, we go on to Bill. Uh, all your slides will be available on the NACO website. Is that correct? They'll, they'll all be available. Great. Thanks very much. A terrific amount of information in that uh, 2022 challenge program is uh, challenge program really is, uh, exciting. So uh, yeah, now I'd, uh, I'd like to you know, pass the baton on to Bill. Uh, it's all yours, Bill. Go ahead. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as Jamie has pointed out to you, DOD is emphasizing the importance of climate resilience. Uh, there is a recent mandate to uh, for every facility to update their facility master plan to address climate risks and, and for every facility to update their integrated natural resource management plan to address climate risks. Why does this matter to you, uh, those of you who are not in the DOD community? Because of the definition of military installation resilience, which is up on your screen now. And I want you to focus on the fact that it's any climate risks that adversely affect the military installation or essential transportation, logistical, 
or other necessary resources outside the military installation that are necessary in order to maintain, improve, or rapidly establish installation mis mission assurance and mission essential functions. As many of you know, the majority of employees on most military installations don't live there. They're civilians, <clears throat> they live off base. And as one DOD official uh, put it, if the communities that support the base are not resilient, the base is not resilient and mission readiness is at risk. So projects that support the resilience of communities on which the base relies will be mission, will be military installation resilience projects. Uh, and it, I think you are in the best position to identify those projects, really in a better position than the base itself. Um, well, first, let's talk about what are the bases doing in response to this uh, resilience mandate. And I'm sorry to say there's not yet a clear answer. There's a lot of directive from the top of DOD, but there's not yet a lot of specific on the ground guidance of how to implement that. And bases are going about it differently. Every facility has a multiple number of people that are involved in resilience, such as the, uh, the base um, <clears throat> facilities manager who's in charge of infrastructure, roads, buildings, et cetera, the base uh, natural resource manager who may know about good nature-based systems for managing, but is not typically involved in base infrastructure planning. Uh, most bases do not have a resilience coordinator and somebody who's pulling it all together. They're learning it as they go along. I explained that there is a mandate for all the bases to do a comprehensive risk assessment. Unfortunately, some bases are closing that process to the community because of security risks involved. Uh, they, they want to control that information. And so it may not be immediately evident what they're going to decide. But in the long term, projects are going to come out of that project, uh, out of that process. Many of those projects may be base specific, but many of them may start identifying community uh, opportunities. And the communities should, to the extent they can, involve themselves in that process when they have the opportunity to do so, because they have a lot of resources that the base uh, can use. But what else can you do? And I have some specific uh, recommendations. First of all, know your state and local projects, and then go back to that definition I gave you and look for a military resilience opportunity, something that may not have even occurred to the base. I'll give you a specific, uh, some specific uh, examples. In North Carolina, Highway 24 through Swansboro is a critical artery between Camp Lejeune and Cherry Point and the Port of Moorhead uh, City. And it's also a key transportation route for people that work on the base. It was threatened with storm erosion and NIFWF uh, funded a project to put in a living shoreline to protect that road. That is an example of something that, and, and it was supported by the military and it was supported by Surpass because of the military importance of that state DOT uh, project. Uh, in the North Carolina pending budget is a proposal for a uh, pilot program to demonstrate the efficacy of water farming. Water farming, for those of you who don't know what it is, is a way of reducing flooding, inland flooding on rivers that uh, by taking water and diverting it onto farmland typically or other uh, fallow land to lessen the impact of a flood surge in a storm event. Uh, the idea is you will pay people to receive that money, and that will be cheaper than building levees uh, and, and other storm containment centers. The project they're looking at is in Goldsboro to protect the hospital uh, access. But Goldsboro also, Air Force Base also has a flooding problem from that same watershed system. And I could foresee if that budget uh, gets approved that that $20 million of state fund could be used as the state match against a larger REPI project to uh, examine a larger flooding uh, uh, pilot program that benefits the base. The hospital also supports the base. So there's an example of identifying a, uh, a military connection to a state project. There's a lot of state and local money coming for resilience projects. This, $400 million proposed in, in one of the North Carolina budgets that's pending. 
and identifying local infrastructure needs, floody, flood planning opportunities, fire control opportunities, and relating those to the military installations uh, in that area could lead to an opportunity of levering, leveraging that state money uh, into a federal program. Another specific thing you can be doing is get a community risk, a, a community-wide risk assessment and resilience plan. Uh, the state of North Carolina did a statewide climate risk assessment, and that was a starting point. I think there will be more and more uh, community planning efforts. Jamie pointed out there's some uh, federal support money for some of those planning programs. Uh, uh, Old CC uh, has money for that. And specifically right now, for example, the low country of South Carolina is doing a military uh, installation readiness, uh, a resilience review that includes all of the counties around Paris Island and Marine Corps Air Station Buford and the all the communities that support them and those stations to look at the resilience needs holistically so they can come up with a plan that supports all of them. Now, that's not immediately a REPI project, but what OLDCC uh, contemplates is that the projects that come out of that may well be REPI eligible. So uh, as Jamie pointed out, the deadline for this year's REPI challenge is uh, only a couple weeks, only a week or so away, but it rolls around every year. And there's a bigger pot of money in what's called re regular REPI, which the base has to initiate, uh, but there's gonna be a resilience effort there too. So look long-term and be thinking about those kind of projects. Other communities planning support can come from, from other areas. Camden County, South Carolina, uh, Camden County, Georgia is the community that supports Kings Bay uh, Submarine State, Naval uh, Base, which is their main submarine base. They got a large grant from TNC and NIFWIF to do a, uh, a project called Developing a Resilience Implementation Work Plan for Camden County. Again, looking at the entire community on a comprehensive basis. What can we be doing for long-term resilience planning? And that could well lead to projects that would be eligible for REPI funding because they're directly related to supporting Kings Bay and, and making it more resilient. A third way is to, to make as many resilience connections as you can, uh, and then use those to start developing re resilience projects, some of which may end up having a military connection. I'll give you some, uh, specific examples. Uh, we've mentioned the Sentinel Landscapes program. <clears throat> Sentinel Landscapes started out as a uh, concept of the land immediately around the base being uh, dedicated to protecting the base from encroachment, uh, adopting noise ordinances and so on uh, to protect the base's ability to do that. Eastern North Carolina has an 11 million acre, 33 county, unified sentinel landscape. All of Eastern North Carolina is one sentinel landscape and their focus is helping protect the military mission in Eastern North Carolina. A lot, for those of you that are not from Eastern North Carolina, a lot of Eastern North Carolina is farmland and forest land and the military likes to fly low and fast over that land without noise pollution, air, without air pollution and light pollution and um, uh, uh, radar um, electronic pollution. And keeping that land in working lands helps protect the military mission, and that's part of their goal. The because buffers have been the traditional focus on uh, on REPI, it's been a slow transition to identifying resilience projects on that scale. So REPI has agreed to fund a position in uh, Eastern North Carolina Sentinel Landscape of a resilience coordinator to help pull together resilience projects. Uh, across the Sentinel landscape. And I, this is a pilot project for all Sentinel landscapes uh, in the future. So there, there is an, a vehicle for identifying projects across a 33 county area that could have, uh, specific, that will have specific military connections. Other examples of local connections. In North Carolina, there's the North Carolina Coastal Federation, which is highly involved in lots of coastal projects. Their expertise is uh, in living shorelines is so good that the military is now coming to them as a first source. 
let me say a word about water-based projects, living shorelines in particular, which are nature-based systems to protect uh, shorelines from erosion that are ecologically better in the long, and frankly, more efficacious in the long run than hardened structures like bulkheads. Repi money can't be spent on base but things in the water are off base because they're in the public trust water. So last year, Cherry Point got a million dollar repu award for a living shoreline to help protect uh, Cherry Point. And uh, the Coastal Federation was, it, it was key in helping them design that project and put together that proposal. As a result, they've come back to them, uh, the Marine Corps has, with, uh, and I believe they're putting together a proposal to seek uh, money for the relocation of a radar installation at Marine Corps Air Station New River that is being threatened by uh, erosion. And that is probably going to go in as a repu proposal. That's important to your communities because those kinds of living shoreline projects don't have to stop at the fence line. And they have a significant water quality benefit to the community. And uh, they have uh, also additional recreational and uh, fisheries benefits. The Coastal Federation, I'm going to pick on them, uh, has, has also been leading as a follow-on to the North Carolina uh, statewide resilience, uh, climate risk assessment resilience plan, identification of opportunities for large-scale wetland restoration or conservation programs. And large-scale, they mean thousands, hundreds or thousands of acres. A lot of the land they have identified in Eastern North Carolina as good candidate for that is land that underlies military training routes. And as a result, they're putting together a repute proposal to get conservation buff buffers on those uh, properties to preserve them as wetlands, prevent them from being converted to developments or other uh, uses that would be incompatible uh, to military use and that will become a repi proposal. So getting involved with the people in your communities that are already looking at military resilience uh, can lead you to those with expertise and lead you to ideas of how to benefit your own community in ways that uh, there may be other funding available for and it may be military funding because it may have a resilience. Uh, finally, I would note that uh, and this is getting beyond my area of expertise, but my understanding is that uh, FEMA has been amended <clears throat> with a mandate that 4% of all uh, disaster relief funding after a uh, disaster, 4% is earmarked for resilience projects for the future. So if you think about a major disaster and the amount of money that comes out of FEMA, if you've got project, if you've got shovel ready projects in mind, the next time money comes around, our community needs this to be more resilient. And we get hammered by storms and uh, there may be a funding opportunity coming because FEMA will have, will have more money. Those are some examples of, uh, of communities being involved, uh, getting involved with, uh, with the military. I think go back and look at that military installation resilience definition, think about how broadly it can be applied. A lot of the folks within the DOD community that have a long history of REPI uh, have, have a tendency to think in terms of buffers or in terms of specific protection of infrastructure at their base, like a living shoreline that's being eroded, uh, where, where the shoreline is being eroded and the road is being protected. They're not thinking as broadly uh, about um, resilience as, for example, fire suppression in the areas adjacent to the base or in the communities around the base uh, as something that helps assure that the base will be able to function and be able to be served by its local community. That would be a installation resilience project. So. You take the leadership and think broadly about what resilience means and identify those projects. And with that, uh, I'm going to throw it back to the REPI experts who can answer the, uh, the, the technical questions about REPIs. And, and I'll try to give you the benefit of uh, some any experience that I've had. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner.
Commissioner, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Jack. I'm sorry. I'm just, um, uh, I was just complimenting Bill on the amount of information he brought forward. I know I was taking notes like crazy. Uh, and I love your broad thought there of think more broadly. Uh, and the examples you gave, I know that uh, I'll be carrying this to our, our own county management, uh, a number of the issues that you brought forward, especially with the conservation easements. And you're just trying to think in a much larger scale than we have, than I certainly know I have, and I think our county has in the past. Uh, well, Commissioner, and, you know, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a local example to be thinking about. Matsu, uh, yes. right there at Southport, um, they need to preserve the access to that base so that it isn't developed, it isn't threatened um, uh, with encroachment, because for those of you that don't know it, we have a little port in Southport, uh, North Carolina, where almost all the munitions in the world yes. that come out of the United States come out of that port. Yes. So there's a, a railway station down to that port and away it goes. Protecting the resilience of that base and its ability to function is very important to that, to that community. And it's a tiny little base. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is, but they, uh, the, the, what they call the blast zone extends way, way beyond. Not a term that I like to use a lot, but you're absolutely right, Bill, and I thank you for kind of broadening my vision on to what uh, the REPI program could mean to us. Uh, we're going to transition to the Q&A, uh, and if you have a question, again, I'd encourage you to go to the bottom of your, your uh, icon bar there and, and put your questions into the Q&A, and I'm going to turn over the actual asking of the questions to uh, Jack Morgan uh, from our NACO staff you know, to handle that part of it. Jack, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And we've already had a few uh, questions in the in the chat that have been answered, but I'll just quickly go over those. We had a question about the REPI projects in, in Virginia and Maryland, and, and Elizabeth uh, um, dropped the link to where you can uh, see all the REPI projects uh, and the fact sheets there. Um, that link is there in, in the chat. Um, yeah, Jack, can I add one thing absolutely. to that? Yeah, so um, I should have mentioned before, so I apologize. So as Jack and Elizabeth have just mentioned, we do have just a plethora of information online. So all of our REPI projects have a, um, a project fact sheet on them, along with our set in the landscape. They each have project profiles. We have state fact sheets, so we even break it down by state. State. And then on top of that, I didn't mention we have um, a whole site on resilience. So everything that we talked about today is also included, you know, online. We have, um, you know, other webinars that we've put on. So those are the recordings are on there. There's, you know, some fact sheets, some one pagers. So there's just a lot of information online, which um, Elizabeth, if you don't mind, can you also include a link now? Um, the resilience piece in the chat. I think that'd be helpful too, because just be there's wonderful. a ton of information out there. Um, yep, perfect. And Jamie, I'd like to, to, to point out, because it's a frequent question. Um, when I say a shovel-ready project so that you're in line to ask for repi money, everybody understands that environmental projects take a long time to get permitted. You don't have to have your permits lined up, and the project doesn't have to be completed in a year. I mean, there, there there's uh, some time frames involved, so it's a realistic program. You don't have to have done everything in advance. Great, great thank point. you both. Um, just going down the list of, of what we have in, in the chat. Um, uh, Jamie, I know you, you already answered uh, Mr. King about the, the Sentinel landscapes date. I'm not sure how much you wanna uh, reiterate that for folks that might not have seen in, in the chat. Yeah, so the question was, when will the announcement of the new Sentinel landscape designations, um, when will that be? Initially, we have always said it'll be by the end of this calendar year. Unfortunately, we are, um, I think we're going to try something new. So that's something that you guys haven't heard before. This is, this is breaking news. We're going to try something new. I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but because of that, we're just going to need a little bit more time on the announcement. So um, Right now, we're saying that hopefully by the end of January. So nothing bad, just a little bit of a, we're going to postpone it just a little bit to, to do this new thing, which is going to be great. I just can't go into more details, unfortunately. Wonderful. Thank you, Jamie. And, and we'll await that, uh, that news and blast that out to everyone. Um, we've got a question about uh, 
eligibility as far as getting into kind of energy projects and microgrid projects under the 22 uh, challenge. And, and thank you, Elizabeth, for dropping the, the link to that. But I don't know if, if either of you wanted to, to, to comment on, on the, the uh, availability or um, eligibility of microgrid projects when you're thinking about resilience. Elizabeth, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. I responded to, I believe, only Jen, but I would be more than happy to provide the Repi Challenge request for proposals in the chat to everyone. That RFP provides more specific information on eligible projects. Um, but speaking specifically to microgrids, um, not they're not explicitly eligible. There would need to be a tie back to natural infrastructure in order for it to qualify under the Military Installation Resilience Authority. Um, but more than happy to answer any specific project questions that you may have. Uh, they tend to be on a very case-by-case -case basis. And so we're more than happy to speak with you about any specific project questions that you have. But I would recommend starting with that RFP um, as a starting point just to read more about specific project um, information and what may be eligible under the Repi Challenge. Hope that helps. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And and, and maybe that's the a similar answer to our, another question here from, from Graham Holtz about anticipate uh, uh, they're uh, anticipating commercial development uh, near the base and, and would establishment of a mitigation banking program be possible. Uh, again, that may be the similar answer you just gave. Yep, Jack, I would say that we would probably need to speak with you to hear a little bit more about the project and how um, much it ties back to natural infrastructure solutions. So happy to speak um, more offline about specific project details. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, a more broad question here uh, from Helen Rain. Does every base have a, a REPI representative uh, or what would that be at the state level? Yeah, it's, that's a, <laughs> a complicated answer. Um, unfortunately, it's, it looks different by the service. So for example, um, so not every base has a REPI representative, although most all with pretty much all with REPI current REPI projects do. Um, and then for the Navy and Marine Corps, they have what's called CPLOs, which is always a great place, a great starting point, which is the community plans and liaison officer positions. So not necessarily at every base, it looks a little different in each location. And if you're looking for um, one or two in particular, I'm more than happy to help make some contacts. So if you, I can put my email in the chat and I'm more than willing to help make some connections. Wonderful, thank you, Jamie. That's always uh, the hardest thing, right? You can't just knock at DOD's door. So I think just finding out who's the right person is, is always the hardest step. Great, and, and we had a great slide that Bill talked about, about the definition of, of resilience. And, and we have a question here in the chat then about, uh, is there a hard definition of natural infrastructure um, in, in regards to, to REPI and, and resilience? I am not aware of, of a, a hard definition. There is a, a whole initiative in the Corps of Engineers called Engineering with Nature. Uh, I would encourage you to look at that web, their website. Uh, the, the whole idea is to look for as many ways to, in, to mimic nature in, uh, your, in addressing stormwater, in addressing floodwater, in addressing whatever the problem is that you're, you're looking at. North Carolina Department of Transportation is rewriting its whole manual about uh, managing water to incorporate more nature-based systems uh, because they simultaneously do a good job of controlling flood water and remove a lot of pollutants. Uh, an awful lot of pollutants in uh, our waters come from just natural runoff. You know, it's not from industry, it's from sediment and from, uh, from just overwash of land and using nature-based system to slow that process down in, in the management of stormwater, and then nat using nature-based systems 
on the coast to encourage, uh, for example, <clears throat> the, the reestablishment of salt marshes uh, and as natural traps for sediment, salt marshes can actually help fight sea level rise by capturing sediment and allowing the land to gradually rise. So that's a, an example of a nature-based system using oyster reefs, artificial oyster reefs to absorb wave energy uh, instead of building a bulkhead allows the area behind that reef to remain natural, become a marsh, uh, accumulate sediment, provide habitat. Um, so those are examples of, of nature-based systems, but I am not aware uh, there, there may be, I'd be embarrassed if there is, but. Thank you, Bill. Um, we've got a couple questions here about timing uh, and, and length of, of project. Uh, uh, Helen Rain uh, is asking about planning for long-term management of, of REPI projects. Uh, for example, if they created uh, wetlands to help with climate resilience and they would need to manage those um, you know, in perpetuity. So uh, Jamie, could, could you speak at all to, um, to what that would look like as far as uh, ongoing planning and, and partnerships and protection as far as timing? Yeah, so when I, I hear your question, that's one that we're, all, we're very concerned with as well. And so that's definitely put in in terms of the project. So um, as I mentioned before, in terms of REPI, in general, um, we have to have partners. And so we often don't hold, you know, we don't often hold the easement or in terms of the project. So we work with the partners to make sure that it is um, followed through. and. I think all of your concerns in terms of long-term we're also tracking and it's also built into just the project in general. Um, so your concerns are also our concerns and one that we look for when we work on our agreements with the partners to make sure there's a plan in place. Thank you, Jamie. And the second question we had on timing is, is from Dan. Calvert, who is reacting and building off of Bill's recognition that environmental projects can take years to, uh, to implement. And, and then he's citing that in the REPI RFP that ideally the select projects would be executed within six months after funds are obligated. Um, uh, his question then is, does this mean the contract contracting process needs to be completed? Uh, I'm yeah, following I'm not sure the if they... timeline. Yeah, I think I'm following the timeline. So we get our dollars um, in like a year sum, right? So we the, we get a president's budget. We're gonna hopefully get the hundred full 150 million. We have to be able to spend 150 million in a year's time frame. Um, and so once we go into an agreement with someone, there is kind of like a five year for them to spend it. Otherwise it goes back um, to like a larger piggy bank. And so when we're looking for projects, especially ones with incredibly large dollar amounts, like we said, we're putting 40 million on the table, at least for Repi Challenge. Um, right now we are looking for projects that are probably a little bit more further along than ideas. And that doesn't mean that you can't start the idea process and then apply next year. It's just maybe this, this timing isn't best for you because um, we are gonna need to put forth the funds, sign agreements, and then those funds have to be executed. So I guess, you know, Bill made the, the comment and I'm gonna just mention it too, this is a yearly process. And so maybe you're hearing about it for the first time now, which is great. You can start working on the projects building those partnerships, um, getting those agreements, and then, you know, apply next year. And so I don't want anyone to be discouraged by the timeline or discouraged by maybe what you've heard. Um, we just have to be able to obligate them. But yeah, but just to clarify, the money doesn't have to be spent in six months. I mean, there's, as you said, Jimmy, you've got five years. Um, and so there, there, is, there is a requirement that there be a contract between the partner and the military installation for the REPI proposal. That doesn't have to be in place at the time you file your, your REPI request, but it does have to be put into place pretty quickly thereafter. Then yep. you have to start with the process. Money can be committed. I think 
some of the money can be held by the private partner, can it? But it's, but it's, the, you, you know, the Cherry Point Living Shoreline is a thousand foot shoreline. It's going to take several years to design, implement, uh, and and install, uh, and permit. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't let those kind of things deter you. Repi can, will work with you through that process. Yeah, and I want to um, acknowledge Tony's comment in the chat box. So for those who don't know, um, Tony Denisi, he works for the Navy, and he actually helps oversee a lot of these projects for the Navy. So he's way more knowledgeable on the funding part than I am. This is not really the side that I get into, so I apologize. But he made a really good point, um, and I don't know if he can be unmuted, because he could definitely speak to it much more articulately than I can. Um, but he did make the point that um, some funding can be put towards the design um, permitting, then ask for funds um, for construction in later years so that, you know, could be phased approaches. And I don't know if I said that right, Tony, and I don't know if you can be unmuted. So I just wanted to also make or bring, um, highlight his comments as well. Yeah, thank so you. He said I'm think phased. Yeah, him, like, but uh, thank you. Okay, so think phased um, funding request, I think is what he what he mentioned, which makes a whole lot of sense. Wonderful. Uh, we've got a couple more questions on um, usage and, and eligibility. Uh, one from from Valerie here about uh, sands. Uh, can, can funds be used to bring sand from off base, uh, offshore and off base and place on installation beaches? And can we use funds to bring in sediment to augment coastal marshes? Both have suffered degradation due to lack of sand and sediment. I, I, I think I can speak to both of those. Tyndall Air Force Base is undergoing a massive uh, resilience planning process. Um, and part of their plans include sand management plans and sand, uh, uh, you know, moving sand and moving it on, on shore. Keep in mind that REPI can't be spent for money that will, that, for projects that are on base. So if you're talking about moving sand from the water to the base, REPI's not going to pay for that. But it could pay for other parts of the project that would be related to that. Now, thin deposition of, of uh, sediment is something that is actively being looked at in a number of proposals uh, and, and is uh, maybe a strategy for protecting low-lying areas. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're looking at it at areas along the intercoastal waterway, maybe along near Piney Island bombing range for the Marine Corps, which is a low-lying uh, area that's threatened by sea level rise. So, uh, and a lot of research has been done by people connected to the military on the use of thin layer deposition. So, yeah. Uh, and again, engineering with nature, they are all about exploring and finding new ways to do things that are nature based. And then Tony added a comment. Um, and again, the resilience is new, right? I mean, it's in terms of projects that we've been typically doing. So we're learning as we go too. But um, Tony mentioned, I think it could, but um, sorry, it moved on me. Um, he said, I think it could, but only if it was part of an overall large project as you wouldn't want to stop in the fence line, fence line in the effort. So that's up to the repi office. So I think it would, you know, definitely come down to our, the repi law and, and the intent of the law in terms of off base. So I think we'd have to figure that out. There is a question in the Q&A about forest uh, restoration as a resilience project. And, and, and absolutely. And I think the fact there may be a repi proposal coming in North Carolina, I've heard there might be about forest lands adjacent to Cherry Point um, for this exact purpose. And, and is actually think broader than, than, than fire. Think also endangered species habitat. Um, the whole surpass initiative began with taking pressure off of uh, uh, Fort Bragg, which has 5,000 acres of longleaf pine, 
which is a habitat for endangered species, red cockaded woodpeckers. And by increasing that habitat range off base, you took the pressure off the base. That was, I and mean, that's putting it very simply. So if you can, if you're restoring uh, forest and you're doing it in a way that creates habitat for threatened or endangered species that exist on the base, that's an additional protection of the base in its ability to continue to use their resources. Because if they become, uh, and th this may become relevant to the salt marsh initiative that, that the Pew uh, Environmental, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust is putting together for all of the coast of, of uh, the Atlantic coast, expanding the, the range and, and protecting salt, salt marsh. There are a lot of endangered species that live in salt marsh. If salt marsh gets destroyed, either by sea level rise or development, and the only remaining salt marshes on our military bases, all the threatened endangered species that use them will be on the bases. And the bases will be inhibited in their ability because they will be encroaching on, on now critical habitat. They need to expand the range of that habitat. So the forest is not only a fire protection, it may also be a uh, habitat enhancement that protects the base. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I dropped my my email uh, in the chat uh, as well, and Jamie has already dropped hers uh, for any questions that that you may have after this uh, that we haven't uh, addressed yet. But we're, we're getting close to the the two p.m. Eastern hour here. Um, but do see one question still that we uh, that we haven't addressed uh, um, uh, about. E easements being considered for enhancing critical aircraft transit corridors for greater mission protection around military air, air stations, um, which uh, they're referencing that is used under traditional REPI authority. Um, would that be relevant for the resilience authority as well? Aviation easements, aviation easements. Yeah, I mean, it has to um, affect our military's ability to test, train, or operate. So absolutely, in terms of our um, aerial routes, if that's what I'm hearing. So I don't think it's, it does, I think there was a question of, does it have to be like right up against the fence line? And no, it, they do not, in terms of using the REPI authority. And, and I'm not familiar specifically with navigation easements, but that is the, um, part of what's being pursued with this wetland project in East North Carolina that I was talking about, they're looking at conservation easements that um, uh, that allow, that, that will help, and maybe specifically by their language, and therefore maybe it is a type of navigation easement, um, the continued use of um, aircraft flying low and, and, and fast over that land, keep that land in, in some conservation uh, mode, either agriculture or, uh, or forestry, as a way of protecting that air corridor. So whether that's mm -hmm. crafted as a navigation easement, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Bill and, and Jamie, for your presentations and for uh, answering everyone's questions. Um, uh, again, uh, reach out to us if we, if we haven't uh, address your questions and, and to the uh, question in the chat. Yes, we, uh, we, we will share the recording uh, to everyone and it will be also posted on, on NACO's website. I just dropped the link there. Um, I, I will turn it back over to uh, Commissioner Zappel to, to close us out as we've reached the, the hour mark. Thanks very much, Jack. I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Jamie and Bill for all the information you've given us today. It's been a really productive and really informative uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, as uh, Jack was just saying, that he's put his contact uh, info into the chat room. Uh, so if you have other questions, you can reach out to Jack and he'll make sure he gets back in, in touch with you. Uh, and also, again, as a, a reminder, the webinar and all the materials shared will be posted on the NACO website. And with that, at uh, two o'clock, uh, here we are. Uh, thanks for being here and have a great day and, and look for us in the future. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you.